So welcome to a course on measure theory. Technically, it's not really measure theory. Uh, it's more a specific measure, the Lebeig measure. But many courses in different colleges around the world would call it measure theory or real analysis. Um, different titles. But uh, at the end of the day, it's an introduction to measure theory via Lebesgue integration. The question is, <clears throat> what is Lebesgue integration? Why do we care? And what's wrong with Riemann integration? It seems to work fairly well. So why do we need anything more sophisticated? So to illustrate that, let's consider the following example. So here we have introduction to measure theory. And the book that I will be using for this course is Royden's textbook, fourth edition, not the third, third horrible, fourth edition on real analysis. So let's consider the following example. Uh, it's a well-known fact, <clears throat> uh, something that we're actually gonna prove using measure theory as well, but it can be proven even prior to that, that the rational numbers are countable. In particular, the rational numbers from zero to one are countable. So let uh, Q sub K from K one to infinity be any enumeration of uh, rational numbers on Q intersect zero one. So you have all the rationals from zero to one and you say, okay, that's the first one, that's the second one, that's the third one and so on. The fact that the rational numbers are countable just means that if you hone in on any specific rational number like seven sixteenths, it will be somewhere on your list of rational numbers. You will get to every single one of them. It might take a while, but you'll get there. And then what we're gonna do is we're going to define f sub i to be a function from uh, 0, 1 to the reals, where x will map to, I guess we can do it like this, from the reals, will x maps to one of two numbers. It will either map to 1, when will the function map to one if x is an element of the set q1 up until qi? So for example, the 10th function on my list, only q1 through q10 will map to one and everything else otherwise goes to zero. So f1 of x or f1 would look something like this. You have your interval from zero to one, and here's q1 over here. Everything goes to zero except for q1, which maps to one. What is the second function on my list? What is f2? Well, again, you have the interval zero to one, Here's Q1, let's say there's Q2. They both go to one, but everything else goes to zero and so on. So what we have here is a sequence of functions. So we're gonna consider the sequence Fi from I is equal to one to infinity. And when we look at this sequence, we notice some very interesting things. Uh, what are the properties that the sequence has? First of all, <clears throat> every f sub i is Riemann integrable. In particular, they all have a Riemann integral value of zero, but they are all Riemann integrable. Two. It is a bounded sequence. The sequence Fi is bounded uh, between zero and one. 
And more specifically, it's uniformly bounded. It's not just bounded, it's uniformly bounded. Each element of the sequence is bounded, but all of them are bounded by the same two numbers. They're all between zero and one. So it's uniformly bounded. The entire sequence is uniformly bounded. Third property is that the sequence Fi is a strictly increasing sequence. In other words, if you take any point in zero to one, each function will map each value to either the same or a higher value. That's what it means to be increasing. What do we mean by strictly increasing? Each function will take one more value and send it from zero instead of zero to one. So for example, if you look at the two functions that I have graphed, function f1 and function f2, we see that f1 sends one value q1 to one, everything else to zero, including q2. q2 goes to zero. If we throw in q2, just to focus in on it, here's q2, q2 goes to zero. But in the next function, q2 goes to one. So it's a higher function, an increased function. So we have these wonderful properties. <clears throat> Each function is Riemann integrable. The sequence is uniformly bounded. The, the sequence is strictly increasing. And not only that, the sequence converges point-wise. It converges point-wise to f, to a function. What is the sequence that it converges to? Well, f is a, a function from 0, 1 to r, such that each value maps to, well, if you think about it, every rational number will eventually be equal to one and every irrational number will always be zero. So one, if X is Q intersect zero to one and zero otherwise. So we have a sequence of Riemann integrable functions that are uniformly bounded. They're strictly increasing. It converges point-wise to a wonderful function and yet, but F is not Riemann integrable. And why is the function F not Riemann integrable? Well, if you take any partition of zero to one, no matter how refined, there will be rationals and irrational numbers in every subinterval. So each lower sum will be zero, each upper sum will be one. Therefore, the lower Riemann integrable will always be zero. The upper Riemann integrable, integral will always be one. And therefore, F is not Riemann integrable. So we have all of these wonderful properties, four wonderful properties. And yet the function F is not Riemann integrable. How do we resolve this? So there's two things we can do. One is to say, OK, it's not Riemann integrable. What can you do? It's never going to be Riemann integrable. Well, OK, fine. Well, maybe there are other situations out there that we're not considering where these four properties and something else would be enough to conclude Riemann integrability. And we're just missing something. And we can look and try to identify what additional property we would have to have for some other situation that we would be allowed to conclude that the function that it converges to is Riemann integrable. And the answer is that there actually is one additional property that we can add. And that is this one here, point-wise. If the sequence Fi would convert to F uniformly, if it converges uniformly, then F would be Riemann integrable. What does it mean to be uniformly convergent versus pointwise convergent? Because this is only an introduction, we're not gonna get into the nitty gritty, the, the, the details. Essentially what it means is the entire, all, the functions, if you look at every point, they would all converge in some sense together to the function that the sequence converges to. 
as opposed to here, where this point goes, then this point, then this one, then this one, then this one. And you're always going to be having points that kind of lag behind. The thousandth point will eventually go to one. The 10,000th point will eventually go to one. The millionth will eventually go to one. But there are always going to be rationals that are lagging behind the rest, as opposed to all of them kind of going together. We don't have uniform convergence here. If we did, we'd be able to conclude Riemann integrability. We just don't. Sucks to be us. What can you do? This is not Riemann integrable. So that is one approach. The other approach is to say, OK, maybe the problem is not with this particular example, but rather with how we define Riemann integrability. Perhaps there is a more sophisticated form of integrability for which the function f here would be integrable. And all we would need to do is somehow conjure up this more sophisticated approach. Luckily, I don't have to do it because it's been done and it's about 100 years old, 120, I think now, around the 1900, um, was, it was developed by LeBeg, Henry LeBeg. Um, and it's called LeBeg integration. This course is an introduction to LeBeg integration. What is LeBeg integration? Well, that's the entire course, so it's not easily answered. What we're going to do here in this introduction is kind of give you an idea of where we're going. So chapter four, chapter four in uh, this book, is on Lebesgue integration. Why do I need three chapters prior to that? Well, let's think about it. The Riemann integral, the Riemann integral is not just immediately defined. It needs some prep work. And we know that not every function has a Riemann integral. In fact, the example we just did, this function f, Dirichlet's function is what it's called, does not have one. So we have to define the Lebesgue integral and talk about which functions are integrable. And chapter four is on the definition of Lebesgue integration. What is chapter three on? Well, before we can talk about how to integrate a function, we have to talk about which functions we can integrate. So chapter three is on what is called Lebesgue Actually, I think the bag has an extra S. Let me make sure about that. No, I spelled it right. The bag, the S is before the G. The bag measurable functions. So we, before we can talk about how to integrate, we got to talk about which functions we're allowed to integrate. And that's going to be chapter three on the bag measurable functions. Now, before we can talk about Lebesgue measurable functions, we have to go one step further or one step prior, which is to recognize that every function has defined on a specific domain and every integral is also defined on a specific domain. For Riemann integrals, usually it's, let's say, from three to four, right? We're integrating from here to here. Lebesgue integration is a little more robust, a little more sophisticated, but either way, it still has the domain of integration. The functions have domains. Those are sets. So before we could talk about Lebesgue measurable functions, we have to go to chapter two, which is on Lebesgue measurable sets. So the etymology here, is our goal is to talk about Lebesgue integration. Before we can do that, we need to talk about Lebesgue measurable functions. And before we can do that, we need to talk about Lebesgue measurable sets. So the question becomes, what exactly is a Lebesgue measurable set? So to answer that, we have to look at it from the other perspective. First is the concept of a measure. A measure is essentially, and again, in the course itself, we're gonna be much more rigorous and well-defined, but a measure is uh, a method of assigning a size 
to a set. There are certain properties that measures have to satisfy, but essentially a measure is a method of giving a set a size. For example, you have uh, arguably the simplest measure of all called the counting measure. And the counting measure merely um, basically counts how many elements are in the set. So if it's a finite set of 10 elements, its measure will be 10. If it's a finite set of 100 elements, its measure will be 100. If it's an infinite set, its measure will be infinity. Perfectly valid counting measure, uh, perfectly valid measure called the counting measure. So for example, what would the measure, the counting measure for the interval 0 to 1 be? It would be infinity because there's infinitely many numbers between 0 and 1. So the counting measure would give it a value of infinity. Fine, perfectly valid measure. Another measure, a uh, famous one, it's called the Dirac measure. And there's infinitely many Dirac measures. They're all centered at a specific point. So since this is an example, we'll say the Dirac measure centered at x equals zero. What does the Dirac measure assign to a set? Well, if the set contains zero, it gives the value one. And if the set does not contain zero, it gives the value zero. So the Dirac measure on the interval zero to one would be equal to one because the set contains the number zero. We should call it D sub zero for the Dirac measure centered at zero, whereas the Dirac measure centered at zero of the interval zero to one open would be zero because that set does not contain the number zero. Perfectly valid measures. Unfortunately, they are not measures which we can use to create a more sophisticated measure of uh, method of integration, which would agree with Riemann for functions that are Riemann integrable, but which we can extend to new scenarios like the function we did earlier to give that a value where if we have all of these properties, the function would be Lebesgue integrable and have a value that is um, in this case zero, because if you think about it, uh, every one of those functions has a value of zero. So if the sequence did converge to a function, it would kind of be weird if its value was not zero. You have a sequence of functions, each of which has a value zero that converges to a function whose value is something different. That would seem a little weird. So we're gonna develop a Lebesgue integration and we're gonna see that the function f here that it converges to would also have a value uh, of zero when integrated. So what is wrong with these two measures that they don't work? As we're gonna see as we go through the course, we need, we need three properties to hold. We need three properties to hold. Property one, the measure of an interval should be its length. So for example, the measure of zero one should be how wide the interval from zero to one is, which is one we see immediately the counting measure is out because the counting measure, well, we just saw it. the counting measure has value infinity. That's not between zero and one. So the measure of the open interval zero to one should also be one because it has the same length. What exactly is length here? It's the difference between the endpoints. The endpoints are zero to one in both cases. So, Property number one, the, me the, the measure of an interval should be its length and the counting measure fails the first one and the Dirac measure fails as well because the measure of zero one open is zero with the Dirac, but it's not zero with um, the measure that we need. So property number one, measure of an interval should be its life.
This is property number one. And this is very important if we want the, the Lebesgue integral and the Riemann integral to agree, because how is the Riemann integral defined? It's defined using intervals, right? Partition, subintervals, lower sum, upper sum, et cetera. So intervals play a very big role in Riemann integrability. So when we go to measure, instead of lengths, we want them to agree. Property number two is called translation invariance. In other words, if you take an interval and you, or any set, not just an interval, but if you take a set and you shift it right or left, we're focusing on the real number line here. If you take an interval, uh, a set and you shift it right or left, its measure should not change. So for example, we see that the uh, Dirac measure of zero one is equal to one, but if we shift the interval one to the right, we get zero. So the Dirac measure, again, uh, fails. It failed the first property anyways, but here we see that it fails the second property. The counting measure would actually satisfy the for this property because if you shift a set, you don't change its, um, the, its counts. You don't change how many elements are in the set just by shifting. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence, but it already failed the first one, so too bad. The third one is actually um, the most important and the most difficult to uh, work with. Because when, uh, in a later course of measure theory, when you would abstract from the real number line to more general spaces, uh, you don't have to worry necessarily about translation invariance and the measure of an interval is its length because you might not even talking about intervals in the first place. Um, so when you abstract to a more uh, um, general setting, this third property is the one that you really, really need to keep. And it's called the principle of countable additivity. What is the principle of countable additivity? It says, if you have the measure of a union of infinitely many measurable sets where the sets are disjoint, pairwise is joint for uh, j not equal to k. So if I have a union of disjoint measurable sets, and I would like to calculate the measure of its union, I should be able to sum up from one to infinity each individual, individual measure, and they should be equal. So these are the three properties that we need our measure to satisfy. So in the very beginning of the course, we, um, we give, we, we, we talk about the counting measure and say, oh, that fails. The Dirac measure, okay, that failed. So then we say, how, how about this measure? And we give, a, we give a new measure. And this measure looks great on the surface. It satisfies translation invariance, although we have to prove it. Um, the measure of an interval is its length. We have to prove that too, although it's very basic. And then we start to worry about showing that it satisfies the third, which is countable additivity. And we realize very soon, very shortly, that it does not satisfy countable additivity. That if you try to prove it or try to establish it for every set, uh, subset of the real numbers, it just doesn't work. And you have two options. You can either throw it away and say, okay, if that measure did not work, let's try something different. Or you can say, well, we really like this measure. It's really a good measure. It really gives us what we need. We can, we can create a whole theory of integration based upon it. So we want to keep it, but we have all of these sets that don't work. What are we going to do? And the answer is we just throw them away. We say, fine, it doesn't work for every set. So let's not worry about those sets. Let's say, okay, it works for these sets. Let's call these the Lebesgue measurable sets. And let's develop a theory of integration on these sets and say these ones where it did not work, don't use them. They're not allowed, they're out, they're non-measurable. 
And this is the approach that we take in this course. We define a measure. Um, initially, we don't call it a measure because we haven't proven it that it's a measure yet. So we call it what's called an outer measure. We start establishing some of its properties. This is what chapter two is all about. Introduction, uh, uh, outer measure. We then look at section three of the chapter. We talk about which um, subsets of the reals are measurable, for which ones do these properties hold. Uh, and then we see that not everything does and we throw away the rest. Of course, we want to prove that not everything does. So we want to have a section on non-measurable sets and actually construct one. And that's what we do. Um, chapter two, the big measurable sets and the big measure in general. Three, once we have the big measurable sets and we've thrown out the rest, we talk about the big measurable functions. Now we have those. Chapter four, now that we have the functions that we want to integrate, let's actually talk about Lebesgue integration. And of course, this is not an easy course. This is generally um, a course for graduate students or for upper undergraduate students. So each of these sections has intricate proofs. Um, it's very important not just to look at the results, but to go through the proofs themselves because the techniques that are used in the proofs uh, are often the techniques that you want to use to solve homework and exam problems. Um, but two, three, and four is really, chapters two, three, and four in Royden are really the core. Chapter one is preliminaries. I don't plan on going through chapter one, but when I am working on other material that references chapter one says, oh, by this theorem in chapter one, we know this, um, I'll probably go ahead and, and throw that in as a, as a lemma or as a theorem, just to say, okay, this is from one, we'll do it now, because now we need it. Um, of course, once you have the theory, chapter five is further topics of integration. Chapter six is connecting differentiation and integration. Interesting, when you first do calculus, differentiability comes first, and then we do integrability after. Here, it's exactly the opposite. We do integrability first and then connect it. And then chapter seven and eight are some extremely important examples of the big measurable um, uh, uh, spaces, functions, uh, and, and the LP spaces are extremely important. And that's gonna be the course. So this course is gonna cover chapters two through eight in Royden. And now that we have this introduction under our belt, we are ready to begin. So I will see you in the first real lecture. And um, I hope you have a lot of fun. So I'll see you there.